night. We will we'll pause and stand. We'll see our prayer. Yes. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God. O Heavenly King, comfort the Spirit of Truth, word of our present, and for those all things, the tragedy of things in the world life, come and abide us, cleanse us from every stain, and save our souls. Oh, good one. Amen. We are blessed tonight to have Father Isaac, the son of the parish with us and his family. You might have to scoot out before we're finished, but they're welcome to stay as long as they like. It's always nice to have a son of the parish uh, visit who's a priest. So, uh, you all know him from uh, his days before he was a priest. And then he's sent off to serve somewhere else and he comes back. So it's always an encouragement to see that. Um, tonight we are on to part six of our class on the history of Christianity. Uh, tonight we're going to cover the Council of Chalcedon, roughly the time period approaching the council and then up to the fall of Jerusalem and there's a timeline here of significant dates um, on the right in black are uh, specifically church related dates of saints and events and then on the left you have I guess political related governmental related dates when Rome is sacked by the Visigoths until the Hun Justinian the first his reign to kind of get a little uh, a little more context um, but before we jump into all of this we have to pause for a second and just talk about monasticism first because we haven't we haven't dedicated specifically any time to the or, origin of monasticism so um, Metropolitan Callistos where this is what he says about monasticism in his book, The Orthodox Church, which many of us have read. He says, the monastic life first emerged as a definite institution in Egypt and Syria during the 4th century, meaning the 300s. And from there, it spread rapidly across Christendom. It is no coincidence that monasticism should have developed immediately after Constantine's conversion. At the very time when the persecutions ceased and Christianity became fashionable the monks were the us with their austerities were martyrs in an age when martyrdom of blood no longer existed they formed the counterbalance to an established christendom people in rome in roman society were in danger of forgetting that rome was an image and symbol meaning the empire was an image and symbol not the reality they ran the risk of identifying the kingdom of God with an earthly kingdom. The monks, by their withdrawal from society into the desert, fulfilled a prophetic and eschatological ministry in the life of the church. They reminded Christians that the kingdom of God is not of this world completely. What the monastics, the rise of monasticism, is a, is a natural response to the Christian struggling with how does one live in the world? Um, in the midst of persecution, the intensity of the situation, in a sense, has a purifying effect on one's faith. And either you stick with it or you don't. But when the pressure is off, it's easy then to get lazy and to compromise and to make excuses and so forth. We all know this is true. And so in the life of the early church, this is a natural kind of response to that ease of life, in a sense. This intentionality of austerity, of difficulty of one's life, intentionally making one's life inconvenient for the sake of fulfilling Christ's commands. And that's basically what monasticism is structured to do. Um, you have examples of, in a sense, inspiration of, of monastics before this, of course. Saint, um, the prophet Elias, St. John the Baptist, the Virgin Mary, these are all seen as 
in a sense, forerunners or precursors of monastic life because they all are delicate, dedicated solely to the love of God and they do not enter into marriage. They de dedicate their celibacy to the worship of God. Of course, then after the rise of monasticism, you have innumerable monks. St. Paul the Hermit of Thebes is one of the first of these men. He is born in 229. It's in the midst of the uh, Decius persecution that he kind of flees society and goes into the desert and lives there. And nobody knows about him until St. Anthony the Great finds him um, in the late, in the, in the 340s. He dies in 342. Um, and his withdrawal from the world is for the sake of his soul. St. Anthony the Great, the first, um, the father of the, the, of the hermits, we, we call them, um, he's born at the time of the Decian persecution, right around 250. And he, in his life, sees the conversion of Constantine and the change going on in the empire and he in a sense again steps away from society for the sake of his soul and then what occurs is that society chases after him if you know the story of saint anthony he goes into the desert hides for like 20 years and then people find out about him and they literally break down his door to find him and to pull him out of his cave and to ask him advice and this is a the pattern basically of the great monastic saints. They go and hide for the sake of their souls to pr pray and to repent and to seek God. And then after that initial period of seclusion, they get pulled back in they, they're, or sent back in. God sends them back for the sake of society. Um, and so this movement away and for the sake of themselves and their soul also leads to the benefit of society. Um, you have three forms of monasticism. The Eremitic life, which is the life of the hermits. The, the Cenobitic life, which is the life, the communal life of a, a large monastery. And then you have what we call the skeets, where you have a small community under the obedience to an abbot. Um, and this would be characteristic of the monastery closest to us, um, our Holy Archangel Michael's skeet. It is a small community with an abbot. It's actually um, a unique, somewhat unique in that uh, it has, uh, it's one community with both monks and nuns. Typically it's only monast monks or nuns, men or women in a, in a monastic community. Um, but the St. Holy Archangel Michael has um, an abbess and an abbot, but they're on the same property. You have this also in Essex, England, at St. John the Forerunner. Um, and this was something also you found early on in Egypt, where monasticism initially has its flower. It's in the deserts of Egypt, and then into Syria, and then as we talked about into um, what is Cappadocia, modern-day Turkey, um, modern day Greece, southern France, Italy. Um, and so many of the saints here listed were monks or nuns. The, the life of the monk is one of prayer. This is what characterizes their, their life primarily. St. John Chrysostom says of monastics, they are adorned with the worship of God and with prayers, singing much earlier than the birds, living with the angels, conversing with God. This is the character of their life. Um, and so this emergence of monasticism marks the history of the church and throughout its history the monks become 
a bulwark of the faith, of defenders of the faith. Often being, in a sense, the most ardent, the most outspoken, the most willing even to give their lives. Many, But like everything, um, you have good monks and you have bad monks. You have sane monks and you have crazy monks. So just being a monastic isn't a guarantee of sanctity. Um, as we go through some of these events in the history of the church that we'll cover are marked by uh, monastic riots, uh, as well as monastic communities standing up to defend the faith. Um, and so we don't want to think of monasticism somehow as a, a perfect institution or structure uh, that cannot, in a sense, fall into to, to problems. Um, no, nothing like that exists um, in the world because the world is fallen and men are fallen. Um, and we don't we don't look at the monks as being perfect in that sense, but their way of life we do call angelic, um, and their calling is higher than our own, in a sense, because of what they have given up. Um, questions on monasticism. I guess one thing that's always i've had in my mind is if we're called to serve christ mm -hmm. and to do things for other people and to help other people how is removing yourself from society a help a help it's a great question <laughs> um the the work of the monastic primarily is one of prayer and so their their prayer for the sake of the church is their primary work, um, which is a hidden work that, in a sense, is not. It's not the. It's not the physical work of clothing the poor, feeding the poor, housing the poor, visiting prisoners. Right, th th those things, those tangible things. Um, their work is the, is the work of praying for the living, those suffering, and for the departed. Mother Nectaria, who. Some of you, I don't know if any, if she, she, I think she, did she visit here once? The newly departed Mother Nectaria? She must, yeah, we, we would, do, the church would support her regularly, send donations to St. Paul Skeet. Um, I would regularly, when I was in Memphis, visit and serve liturgy for her. And um, she always had this massive list of people she was praying for or asking the priests to pray for when they come. And every and the lists were updated twice a year. Um, and she was always wanting to know, well, how's so-and-so doing? I've been praying for them. How's so-and-so? They're on my list. They're the, you know, and um, the the unseen work of prayer um, often is the most important work, the work of the hands come second um, the prayer that the church prays when you listen to the services right um, the prayer of the church is for the holding together of society in many ways for peace of all people for unity of all people for the civil authorities and the armed forces right for peace for good weather for a good harvest for a good uh, so for to avoid natural disasters, right? This is what the church is continually uh, praying for and what the monks also themselves are praying for as well. Um, and so that work, in a sense, if, they, if, if, if holy people weren't praying, the world would end. It would fall apart. Um, so you have that as the primary thing that monks and nuns do. But... So they, they go back, but again, the pattern is you, you seclude yourself for the sake of your soul, but then you're pulled back in. God sends you back in, right? So we'll start with St. John Chrysostom as, a, as the example here. He dies in 407. He's the first date here on our list. Um, he goes off as a young man, becomes a monk, lives a very austere life, um, but his, his fasting actually damages his health, and he has to come back into the city for the sake of his physical health after, after having been a monk for a number of years. 
Um, it's then that he's, in a sense, he remains a monk, but then he's ordained a deacon, and he becomes responsible for all the widows in the city of Antioch. Um, he's kind of the administrator. Um, so his seclusion, in a sense, is the, prepared him, in a sense, spiritually prepared him for then the work that he would have to do in public. So, so this is often the case. The monastic goes back, secludes themselves, but then also comes back forward and, 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 and aids the, the, the church in society. Um, so that's kind of the second thing they do. Their prayer and then what they then bring back, the advice, the wisdom, the understanding, because they've entered into the spiritual life. They understand the nature of humanity and they can actually uh, give good advice, give good direction, give, have insight. And so um, St. John then is uh, ordained a priest. He becomes the preacher of the great church in Antioch, the cathedral church. He's the one giving the sermons all the time at the, at the cathedral. Um, it's his homilies that we still have to this day. He's, he and Augustine probably were, are the most, their work is the most, um, we have, we've kept their writings more than anybody else. In terms of the volumes in books, Chrysostom rivals Augustine in terms of the sheer volume. So he's, Chrysostom is not his name, it's his title. It means golden mouth. In a sense, he's the preacher. He's the pre preeminent preacher of the church. So his monastic seclusion, in a sense, prepared him for being able to, to speak the truth. In society and so it's a reciprocal relationship and the same thing is true of us right we have this whole season of Lent right in the church where every year we kind of like draw back or at least we're supposed to out of society draw back to feed our soul and then go back to it so the same pattern is true even of the laity St. John then is literally kidnapped by the emperor in Constantinople um, and from Antioch and brought to the capital to be made the archbishop. Uh, and then St. John continues his ministry, preaching the gospel, calling all to repentance, all, even the wife of the emperor, um, Eudoxia. And that gets him in trouble where he's exiled twice by the emperor who kidnapped him. And he dies in exile in 407 um, with the famous words, glory to God for all things at his death. Um, it's his liturgy we serve mostly in the church on Sunday mornings. So, But you, what you see in the life of St. John Chrysostom, again, is the perspective of the church on the world. It is fallen, but it can be redeemed. It can be made holy, it can be sanctified. Otherwise, why give any effort? Everyone would flee from society into the, into the deserts and live separate from society as a whole, but that's not, that's not what monasticism does. Um, it's, it's, it pulls back, but for the sake of society, for the sake of civilization, it pulls back and then has a dialogue with it from its seclusion. Um, and the church, because the church feels that with, the, with God, all things are possible. All things can be redeemed. Any person can be redeemed, whether that's the emperor and the empress or the most lowly poor person, anyone is worthy of the, the, the message of salvation. And so, um, and that that's the work of the church to call all to redemption. Um, and even when the, when, so in the life of St. John Chrysostom, you have a man who has grown up in a society that has embraced Christianity. And then the emperor embraces him to the point of kidnapping him. Um, and makes him archbishop, and then exiles him, turns on him, and turns his back on him twice, right? Um, 
but St. John Chrysostom in no way strives to initiate some kind of uh, revolt against the, against the structure of the empire, against the emperor. He takes his suffering, he bears his cross, and he prays for the salvation of the world to the point of death. So, question. Oh, oh sorry, I was just going to ask. <clears throat> when does the idea of uh, there being monastic orders come along? Is that a later development? We'll get, monastic orders don't exist in the Orthodox Church. Okay. Monastic so, orders is a medieval um, phenomenon that's in the West. That's a Western European phenomenon starting in France. But that's 11th century. So, uh, post-schism. So we'll get to that, actually. So, so St. John becomes, in a sense, another one of these iconic bishops of the church, just like St. Basil the Great and the Cappadocian Fathers. That's why he's there's this uh, grouping called the Three Holy Hierarchs, which includes Basil the Great, Gregor the Theologian, and St. John Chrysostom. They become, as a group, as a whole, iconic of what it means to be a good bishop. Again, but there's... We know of examples of bad bishops. So the church upholds, in a sense, what it looks like to be a good bishop because we know that's not just a given again. Just because you're a priest or a bishop doesn't make you holy. Okay? So the next, in 418 then, we have something called Pelagianism condemned. This has nothing to do with plagiarism. Um, Pelagianism actually comes from west uh from uh what is great britain south the southern part of great britain um the roman portion of of that island and uh pelagius was a scholar and um basically he put forth a novel idea pelagius was a british biblical scholar and theologian who lived in rome so he came from Britain, came to Rome in the late 4th and 5th centuries. He stressed the human ability to fulfill the commandments of God and thus man's responsibility for his own salvation. The role of Jesus was viewed by Pelagius as only setting a good example. And divine grace has no, in a sense, no place. The teaching was opposed by St. Augustine the leading figure in North Africa, the North African first church at the time, while Pelagius in his claims that humans can alone <coughs> do what God requires had emphasized the freedom and human will and the ability to control one's motives and actions under the guidance of God's law, Augustine insisted that no one can control his or own, her own motivation and that person, that each person requires the assistance of of God's grace if he or she is to will and to do good. Only with the help of divine grace can an individual overcome the force of sin and live rightly before God. Pelagius was excommunicated by Pope Innocent I in 418 and then condemned the council in Carthage in 418. Um, the issues of human freedom and divine grace, however, then remained a central topic of debate throughout the rest of the history of the church. And even to this day, we still argue about this. Um, what is the place of human freedom? What role do we play in our salvation? Or do we play none? Does God choose to save us? And we have no part in that? This is, this is a a debate that has, in a sense, gone back and forth through Christ, Christendom, um, even to our own day. It has not died away, even though Pelagianism has been condemned. Um, and that's because the views of the, the, the views of St. Augustine were not received by everyone. August, Augustine's response um, to Pelagius was seen as an overreaction by many. Basically, that he's, he overstated his case. He overemphasized our, in a sense, inability to do anything. Um, 
and that didn't fit with the gospel. And this discussion of St. Augustine who dies in 430 will continue to go on and we will come back to it. We won't address it actually tonight because there's not enough time. Um, it'll go on and on and on and even till this day. Um, and, the, and, the, and the understanding of Augustine's views on original sin um, and predestination, these kind of things, will carry over into the Reformation. Um, and what we have to kind of at this moment understand is that in 430, say Augustine's views are his own. They become normative of the church of Christianity in the West only later. Okay. And there's a process to all of that. And um, but we can't get into that at the moment. So, because it hasn't happened yet. Um, but what is happening at this time is Attila the Hun. 434 to 453. Anybody know who Attila the Hun is? He has nothing to do with Job of the Hut. I don't know. I, in my mind, I always associate the two. But no, he wasn't. Per well, no, no, he wasn't Persian. I wouldn't. I, I wouldn't say that. Um, Attila, Attila the Hun, the Huns, were a people that had come into Europe from Central Asia, um, and I had mentioned this all, uh, before. Because they came in, they pushed the Germanic tribes further in to uh, the Roman Empire. Um, but Attila was a brilliant general. He first attacked the Roman Empire in the east along the Danube uh, frontier in 441. This is the Central Europe, Eastern Europe area. Um, what is the Danube is the border for modern day Romania. Um, and Serbia and Bulgaria, those countries, um, going up into Hungary. Um, modern day Belgrade was destroyed. Um, in 443, he attacks again. Modern cities of Nis and Sofia um, are destroyed. Um, he surrounds Constantinople from the landward side, but cannot penetrate the walls. Uh, he attacks. His attacks of the uh, eastern portion of the empire continued on and off through 447. But in 451, he invades Gaul, which is modern-day France. Then he invades Italy. Um, according to a version of this narrative related in the Chronicle Pictum, a medieval Hungarian chronicle, uh, Pope Leo I goes out, he, he leaves the walls of Rome when, when Attila has surrounded Rome. And he promised Attila that if he left Rome in peace, one of his successors would receive a, would receive a holy crown. And so there's this a legend of Leo, the Pope of Rome, who we'll talk about because he's a major figure in the Fourth Council, um, that he, he goes, has this conversation with Attila, and Attila leaves. And never touches Rome. And the, the, the legend then says that it's because Leo had promised that one of his successors would be given a holy crown. And that was understood by the Hungarian chronicle to mean the descendant is Stephen, the first king of Hungary. And the Hungarians trace their descent from Attila. I guess that's why they're called Hungarians. Um, and so you have the pressure of Attila pushing the the um, pushing on the Germanic tribes. Um, that partly that that pressure from the Huns even before Attila is why the Visigoths get pushed in to the empire. They sack Rome in 410. Um, the Visigoths and other Roman uh, Germanic tribes will become. Uh, 
a reality within what was the, that, that part of the Roman Empire um, for the rest of history up until our day. Their, their descendants, you know, are, uh, are, are us. We're, we're the descendants of those barbarian tribes, many of us, mixed in with Romans and other people, Celts, and so forth. Um, so as, as things in the West are starting to get dicey because of the Germanic tribes coming in, um, the power of the Roman Empire is lessening in the West, and thus the Germanic tribes are able to come in and control different portions of it. Um, in the midst of all of this, in the East, you have the Third Council of 431, which we have discussed a little bit, um, the, the upholding of the teaching that the Virgin Mary should be called Theotokos. Um, that has everything to do with the fact that she gives birth to God incarnate, and that's why she has the title, because of the son she gives birth to. It's all reflective of who her son is. Um, but the decision of the Third Council which is led by St. Cyril of Alexandria. In 431, it, the council's over, but the issues aren't over. Nestorius, who is the uh, bishop of Constantinople, has been expelled. Um, but there's a lot of people that were sympathetic to Nestorius, specifically many of the, the bishops and the faithful in Antioch. And... Cyril, who was ne not one to be always very precise with his language, he kind of bounced around in the word choice that he used. And, and when you're dealing with theology, you have to get very precise and be very consistent with what you're saying. Otherwise, you create confusion and conflict. <coughs> um, Cyril, through letters with John of Antioch, basically ends the Third Council in 433 through a, a series of concessions that Cyril makes to further define what he means so that those in Antioch understand what Cyril means by how that Christ is fully God and fully man and how he explains that with his language um, so that they can understand and agree with the council. That's resolved in 433. Um, let me read to you quickly from Metropolitan Callistos Ware's work, the Orthodox Church. Um, so after, this is now 449. So Alexandria had won, in a sense, they'd been the champion. The Church of Alexandria had championed the Third Council. Okay? Metropolitan Callistos where it says, Alexandria won another victory at a second council held in Ephesus in 449. But this gathering, so it was felt by a large part of the Christian world, pushed the Alexandrian position now too far. Okay? Cyril has died. He is reposed. He's been replaced by someone named Dioscoros of Alexandria. He's the patriarch. He's the one that presides over this synod in 449. Dioscoros of Alexandria, Cyril's successor, insisted that there is in Christ only one nature. The Savior is from two natures, but after his incarnation, there is only one incarnate nature of God the Word. This is the position commonly termed monophysite. It is true that Cyril himself had used such language, but Dioscoros omitted the balancing statements that Cyril had made in 433 as a concession to the Antiochians. To many, it seemed that Dioscoros was denying the integrity of Christ's humanity although this is almost certainly an unjust interpretation of his standpoint. Only two years later, in 451, now, Emperor Marcion summoned to, Cal to Chalcedon 
a fresh gathering of bishops, which the Church of, of Constantinople and the West regarded as the fourth ecumenical council. The, the pendulum now swung back in the Antiochian direction. The council rejected the monophysite position of Dioscorus, proclaimed that while Christ is a single undivided person, he is not only from two natures, but in two natures. The bishops acclaimed the tome of St. Leo the Great, the bishop of Rome who had gone out to face Attila, in which the distinction between the two natures is clearly stated, although the unity of Christ's person is also emphasized. In their proclamation of faith, they stated their belief in one and the same Son, perfect in Godhead and perfect in humanity, truly God and truly human, acknowledged in two natures, unconfused, unchangeable, indivisible, inseparably. The difference between the natures is in no way removed because of the union, but rather the peculiar properties of each nature is preserved, and both combine in one person and in one hypostasis. The definition of Chalcedon, we may note, is aimed not only at the monophysites in two natures, unconfusedly and unchangeable, that was the language against the monophysite position, but also at the followers of Nestorius, quote, one and the same son, indivisibly and separate. Nestorius had tried to divide Christ into two persons, in a sense. Not intentionally, but that was the out that was the the, the outworking of what he taught. And so his teaching was condemned. But then the Ascorus and his followers were going overboard, the council held, about the nature of Christ and confusing how he is God and man. Saying that his divinity and his humanity come from two natures, that, but then become one nature in him. And then the question is, well, what does that mean, right? And so that's why the Chalcedonian de definition says, no, it's from two natures and in two natures, and that those two natures are combined, but unconfused. They're retained as two separate natures. They're not changed by being mingled together, in a sense, to create a new one, a new thing taking two things to synthesize into one. They're saying that's not what happened. That the divine nature and the human nature come together in the one person of Christ. And because they're together, the divine divinizes or makes holy the human. But the human nature, in a sense, isn't changed. Its nature is not changed. Christ's nature has a fully human nature. He doesn't take just part of human nature. Does everybody follow? But by putting them together, uniting them, without confusing them, humanity, all, and this is, goes back to what St. Gregory the Theologian said, what is not assumed is not saved. If Christ doesn't take up a full human nature, then he doesn't save a full, full human nature. And this will be played out in the Fifth Council and the Sixth Council, because the next two councils will deal with the aftermath of this council. Because the followers of Dioscorus go back home from the fourth council and they revolt in northern Egypt. They do not accept Chalcedon. That's why they, to this day, are called non-Chalcedonian churches. Because they don't accept the fourth council held at Chalcedon in 451. But the question was always at Chalcedon. How do we understand Cyril from the Third Council? That's the question. And the, and the Tome of Leo is upheld as being a, you know, in harmony with what Cyril said. Now we change kind of from theological to political administrative. Okay. So the aftermath of all of this is 
you have the emergence basically of a parallel organization or a parallel group that now um, break communion with the church and set up their own parallel jurisdiction in the empire to those who uphold Chalcedon. They become the Coptic church. Also, the Nestorians did the same thing before this, and that's there's a there's still to this day a Nestorian church because they don't accept the third council. Um, but this is the emergence of this of this reality that we live with still to this day of of the non-Chalcedonian churches that don't accept Chalcedon. Um, and this is mostly in North Africa and uh, the Middle East, where you find them, and down the coast of East Africa into Ethiopia. Um, but Chalcedon doesn't just deal with theological issues. There's a number of administration questions, right? How do you organize the church? How do you organize the church? How do you run it in a sense of how do you um, how do the how are the clergy to behave? How are the lady laity in a sense to interact in, with certain questions, right? And so the councils deal with those kind of questions as well, not just the very important theological questions of the nature of Christ's divinity, but also <coughs> basic questions of morality and ethics how one lives in the world, the laity and the clergy. And so I'm going to read to you quickly here. This is Lee Donald Davison's book on the first seven ecumenical councils. He's going to summarize, in a sense, the, what, what some of these canons at Chalcedon are. So the assembled fathers then, after, that they, after they dealt with uh, the question of the natures of Christ, then... They debated 30 disciplinary canons. The bishops themselves were enjoined not to sell ordinations, meaning it's called simony. You can't pay to become a priest or become a bishop. Okay, so They say that you couldn't do that because it was happening. If they're saying don't do this, it's because it's happening, right? You don't give a, a rule unless there's a problem. Okay. The bishops were not to wander from place to place, not to receive another's clergy, not to delay the consecration of bishops in order to profit from the revenues of the vacant see. So if you're the more, more senior bishop in an area and a, a city in your area, their bishop has, has departed, and you're kind of looking out for that flock temporarily until, a new, they, until you ordain a new bishop for them, but you're receiving revenue from those churches right they're saying you can't put off ordaining a new bishop to keep the revenue stream coming right okay human these aren't no these aren't new problems that we're dealing with here um not to intrigue with the government to divide in a sense diocese or sees they were told to hold synods twice a year and to appoint stewards as auditors of Episcopal finances. No comment. The clergy were ordered not to enter state service, meaning the clergy couldn't work for the government directly. All clerics were to be ordained for a definite charge and to stay under the jurisdiction of the ordaining bishop, that you couldn't just be ordained and kind of as a free-floating priest. You had to be ordained for a specific church, to serve at a specific church, or for a specific reason. You didn't have, like, clergy at large, just kind of floating. You had to be attached to an altar, which is still true to this day. A priest doesn't just float. He's attached to a specific altar and to a specific bishop. Father, did they not catch traveling priests? So in, like, some of the European countries that, like, homilies they're still attached to a specific diocese and to a specific church they have the blessing to go out right but that comes from the bishop and they have the blessing to preach in his diocese 
And if another bishop wants to give him the blessing to come to his diocese, he can. But again, it has you have to do you have what you do has to be done with a blessing. No freelancers. Okay. Um, um, all clerics were to be ordained for a definite charge and to stay under the jurisdiction of the ordaining bishop. They were to carry letters of commendation with them when traveling. So you had to have a letter from your bishop saying that he had ordained you and that you were in good standing. You weren't some like rogue priest, right? Which is true still to this day. If I go somewhere and visit a different church, one, I have to tell my bishop. And then two, the bishop, if it's in a different diocese, I have to tell that bishop. My bishop has to tell that bishop that it's okay for me to be gone and if it's okay for me to enter that church. And letters, in a sense, have to be exchanged. Okay. Um, the staffs of various ecclesiastical institutions within a diocese were, remain, were reminded that they were to remain subject to their bishop. The lectors, I mean, enchanters, were allowed to marry, but only women of the Orthodox faith. This is people who are... Uh, the chanters, the singers in the church. There was, there's a, at this point already, there's a specific minor clergy rank for the readers, for the chanters. As for women deaconesses, there was a question about deaconesses, right? A few weeks ago. As for women, deaconesses were to be at least 40 years old, properly examined, ordained, and celibate. Consecrated virgins were not to marry but to be treated leniently, leniently if they did. So this is the ideal, but if you don't reach the ideal, we're going to be nice to you. Okay. Um, women were not to be kidnapped for marriage. I think, you know, we think that's a given, but unfortunately in the ancient world, it wasn't a given. Monks, again, back to monasticism, monks would to be subject to the bishops, and forbidden to marry. So this is instant this is a canon instituting in a sense the practice that was already going on. But there there were abuses. And so they were standard in a sense this is a standard standardizing of conduct. Um, monasteries once erected were not to be converted to secular use. They were holy. All were warned about entering into conspiracies about denouncing the clergy, about seizing the property of a bishop after his death, and about failure to carry letters of peace in communion with traveling. And those were the things that the, the council also dealt with. One of the other issues it dealt with was the famous 28th canon of Chalcedon. You all know that one by heart, right? That's the one where they don't allow priests to dance. No, that's not the one about priests not dancing. That's a different one. Um, the 28th canon established, in a sense, the order of hierarchy of the bishops in the church. There has to be order. And so who is first amongst the order? Okay, And it's an order of brothers. It's an order of honor, basically. It's not an. It wasn't seen as um, a hierarchy of authority or a hierarchy of who got to tell everybody else what to do. It was a hierarchy of honor. And so, if you're gathering, there's a practical application to this. If you're gathering together from different churches, different parts of the world, right? How do you organize yourself? to serve the services. Who stands where? Who goes first? Who goes second? Right? This basically, this hierarchy determines that, is, is one of the outgrowths of it. Okay? And so the, the, the established order within the church was that the Bishop of Rome was first. That wasn't controversial. He had the place of honor because... Rome was the ancient capital of the empire, first and foremost. 
Peter and Paul had died there. It was the city of early martyrs. But this was what was controversial. Canon 28 of Chalcedon put Constantinople second because it was new Rome. It was the new imperial capital. And so it said the new imperial capital should have the same honor as the old imperial capital. Rome did not accept this. And Alexandria, which used to be after Rome, didn't like it either. And their archbishop, Dioscoros, had just gotten in trouble at the council. And so this exacerbated the problems because Alexandria was being bumped in order. Rome, Constantinople, Alexandria, Antioch, and Jerusalem was given the fifth place of honor. And this is what constituted the ancient pentarchy of the church, the five great seas of the church. But again, Rome does not accept this because Bishop Leo thinks this is a challenge to his Roman authority. And Alexandria doesn't like it because it pushes them behind Constantinople. Interestingly enough, Rome does accept this canon, but in the year 1274, when the Crusaders had already taken control of Constantinople and put in a bishop of Constantinople who swore obedience to the bishop of Rome already. That's when the canon was accepted. So, uh, just as an aside. So, Pope Leo's vision, Saint, who is a saint, Saint Leo the Great. This is uh, Father John Strickland. Um, from his series that we've gone through already. He says, as the political elements of Christian, uh, of Christian, in a sense, Roman society began to dissolve during the fifth century, an ecclesiastical element was conceived to replace it. This is specifically in the West. Remember, the German tribes are causing trouble. Roman power is waning. So as it wanes, Something is trying to assert authority to replace that imperial power. The Bishop of Rome became, in a certain way, certain ways, a substitute for the absence and largely impotent Roman emperors. This development was particularly noticeable in the case of Pope Leo the Great, who claimed, largely without precedent, that the papacy exercised jurisdictional preeminence, or principitas, throughout the universal church. He goes on. The canon, which we just talked about, the of Chalcedon, the 28th, the canon and Leo's reaction against it revealed a sharp disagreement that was emerging between East and West on the question of Rome's jurisdictional authority. The big ships of the East obviously regarded Rome as preeminent within the Pentarchy, but in terms of moral authority and prestige, rather than administrative oversight. Okay? He had moral authority, but he wasn't in charge. He couldn't come over and tell you what to do. You were in charge of your own diocese. Each bishop was in charge of their own diocese. Using a simple political logic, the East considered Constantinople as the new capital, naturally similar in status to old Rome. Leo, on the other hand, argued for Rome preeminence of administrative grounds. He was, the he was one of the first to claim that because the apostle Peter had died in Rome, the bishop that ruled there was Peter's unique heir. Here, Leo appropriated a term used first by Cyprian of Carthage, who had spoken of the chair of Peter, right? That lang this language of the chair of Peter, right? Cyprian, bishop of Carthage in 250, had used that in reference to the Bishop of Rome. Cyprian was a Latin father and in, is doubly significant because he had actually distinguished himself during the third century as an opponent of papal administrative overreach. Citing Peter's primacy in the Gospels, he had argued that all bishops share equally 
in the apostles' authority, and that no bishop, even that of Rome, has jurisdictional authority over another. That was Cyprian. Even though he used that phrase, he didn't apply it in the same way that Leo was trying to do. Ironically, Leo now came to use the term Peter's chair to assert a unique authority for the Bishop of Rome. This was an innovation. Nowhere in the New Testament had Peter's primacy ever been defined in administrative or jurisdictional terms. On the contrary, at the important Jerusalem Council, the principle of conciliarity, not Petrine primacy, <clears throat> had led the apostles to their important resolution against the requirement of circumcision. Paul himself had even noted, noted Peter's fallibility in the matter of ecclesiastical leadership in Galatians. Peter was said to be the first in the Gospels, but the character of that status remained totally undefined. So it is here that St. Leo the Great tries to put forward this idea for the first, really the first time. But it's also in response to this outward pressure from the Visigoths. Who are the Visigoths? The Visigoths first appeared in the Balkans as a Roman allied barbarian military group united under the command of Alric I. Um, under Alric, the Visigoths invaded Italy, sacked Rome in 410, they subsequently settled in southern Gaul, and they were called Federati. This term Federati was used, in a sense, for these barbarian tribes who were loyal to Rome, who became, in a sense, uh, um, kind of allies, allies of Rome. And this relationship was established in 418. This developed as an independent kingdom, and its capital was in Toulouse. And they extended their authority into what is modern-day Spain at the expense of the Subi and the Vandals, who had taken control of large swaths of Roman territory. In 507, the Visigoth ruler in Gaul was ended by the Franks under Clovis. The Franks are a different German tribe, who we'll come back to. In 589, the Visigoths under Ricared uh, I left the Arian faith that they had accepted um, when they were converted in a previous century, and they embraced the Nicene Christianity of the church, gradually adopting the culture of their Hispano-Roman subjects in Spain. In 711, an invading force of Arabs and Berbers defeated the Visigoths during the Bas Battle of Guadalete, uh, Guada Gu Guadalete. The Visigoth king Roderick <clears throat> and many members of his Visigoth governing elite were killed and their kingdom rapidly collapsed. So what happens with the Visigoths? They emigrate in, they set up their own kingdoms, but they're Arian in faith. Eventually, though, they convert. But then other forces come in, conquer their own kingdom, but they as a people over time, just integrate into the population. Once, of, once there is no distinction of their faith between the Visigoths being Arian and Nicene, in a sense, the, the distinction starts to disappear. And the, through intermarriage, right, in a sense, the, the, a recognizable Visigoth element of society disappears. It, it becomes coherent, one coherent society because they all share the same faith. And then the Arabs come and conquer them. So, but that's what happens with a lot of these tribes. They come in, they convert, they intermarry, and they, be, through you know, uh, generations, the society in a sense, the distinctions between Romans and Franks disappears through so many generations of intermarriage and the fact that they're all sharing the same faith. They become the people of that place, even though, you know, just it's, it's in many ways, it's kind of what ha is, it, uh, happens in, in the United States and other parts of the world, but that's a whole nother discussion. So, um, 
So the qu next question is, when does Rome fall? Or does it? Because we've all been taught Rome falls and then the Dark Ages. But my um, proposal to you is that that's actually wrong. In the book, in the work, The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, the historian Eber Edward Gibbon chose the date 476 as the date to mark the fall of Rome. This was the year of the abdication of Romulus Augustulus, having been forced to leave the throne by Autocur, a Roman general of Germanic descent. He claimed loyalty to the Roman emperor in Constantinople, that is, the Roman general of German descent, Autocur, claimed loyalty to the Roman emperor in Constantinople, but oversaw portions of the western part of the empire from Ravenna until 493 when he was killed by an Ostrogoth army, another one of these Gothic tribes, the Ostrogoths, under Theodoric the Great. Who is Theodoric? As a young child of an Ostrogoth nobleman, Theodoric was taken as a hostage to Constantinople, where he spent his formative years, received an East Roman education, Theodoric returned to Pannonia, this is modern-day Serbia, around 470. <clears throat> and throughout the 470s, he campaigned against the Samaritans and competed for influence among the Goths and the Roman of the Roman Balkans. So he was in the Balkans, where again these Gothic tribes had been settled, but they became federati of the Roman Empire. They were allies. Um, the Emperor Zeno made him a com commander of the Eastern Roman forces of 483. And in 484, he was named consul. Nevertheless, Theodoric remained in constant hostilities with the emperor and frequently raided Eastern Roman lands. They weren't always trustworthy. At the behest of Zeno in 489, Theodoric attacked Autocur, the king of Italy, emerging victorious in 493. As the new ruler of Italy, he upheld the Roman legal administration. He upheld the Roman legal administration and scholarly culture and promoted a major building program across Italy. In 505, he expanded into the Balkans. And in 511, he had brought the Visigothic kingdom of Spain under his direct control and established hegemony over the Burgundian and the Vandal kingdoms. But Theodoric died in 526 and was buried in a grand mausoleum in Ravenna. He was succeeded by his grandson, Athelric, who was 10. His mother, which I'm not even going to try to say her name, daughter of Theodoric, served as regent. She reigns on her own after the death of her son and 534, until her death in 535, after being imprisoned and murdered by her fellow Ostrogoths. Her death is a reason given for Justinian I to go to war with the Ostrogoths. Odoker, Theodoric, Athelric, and his mother all claimed loyalty to the Roman Empire, Emperor in Constantinople to rule in his name. They all had been given Roman educations and culturally were Roman. This created problems, especially for... Alfred's mother with her fellow Ostrogoths who succeeded in having her son Athelric raised in Ostrogoth manner which resulted in his death from excessive drinking. Theodoric Theodoric is soon killed by the Vit, by Vitigis husband of uh, Montasuntha daughter of the lady, I can't say her name, um, right? So Italy basically is governed by these Gothic kingdoms in behalf of Rome throughout this period, throughout this period here, right? This is the period of St. Patrick, who dies in 461. St. Simeon the Stylite, whose feast day was September 1st, 459. This is his time period. St. Bridget, 
founds her monastery in Ireland in 490. So again, back to monasticism. And it's spread throughout the Roman world and beyond the Roman world. 520, St. Roman the Melodist goes to Constantinople, the great hymnographer, the creator of the Kentuckian. St. Benedict of Nursa, same year, goes to Monte Cassino and sets up his monastery. They're contemporaries of each other. St. Brendan the Navigator lands in North America in 530. He's the Irish monk who goes up through Iceland and around and lands in North America in 530. St. Saba the Sanctified, 532. This is the patron saint of our metropolitan. He is the abbot of all the hermits in Palestine at this point. And this brings us to St. Justinian's reign, 527 to 565. He is Roman emperor. Part of his excuse for going back and taking direct control over Italy is because the kings, his federati, have been killed, have been assassinated by other Ostrogoths. And so he uses that, or he, that's the ex one of the reasons, that he then sends Belisarius, his general, and... Belisarius conquers, reconquers North Africa from the Vandals in 533. And then Italy is, re is retaken 535 to 540. And further conquest happens 541 to 554. Rome is taken in 536 and placed directly under Roman authority in Constantinople. So did Rome fall in this time period? What would we say of Rome that fell? Who's administering it changes, but they all claim to be doing it on behalf of the emperor in Rome. It's, yes, unstable at times, but the culture doesn't change. In a sense, the administrative function of the state doesn't change. The, 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 the Goths come in, they don't change things. They just get the paycheck, in a sense. They get to be the charge. Um, and so the structure of society hasn't changed. Rome is still the same city as it was. It doesn't disappear. It doesn't go into some um, decline, uh, and, and, and a cultural decline in that sense. Um, the church is still, as we see, expanding throughout all this period, taking in those Germanic tribes, catechizing them and trying to baptize them, and going beyond the bounds of the Roman Empire into places like Ireland, also northern, what becomes Germany, northern Germany and so forth, um, and in other parts of the world. Justinian, though, and this is, we'll wrap this up. Justinian doesn't just focus on the boundaries of the empire. He's a great builder. Builder of churches, builder of palaces, builder of, 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 of um, government structures. But of churches, San Vitale in Ravenna, Hagia Sophia in Constantinople, and St. Catherine's at Mount Sinai are just three of the churches he had constructed. He also calls for the Fifth Ecumenical Council in 553 in an attempt to bring back the Christians of Northern Africa who had broken away from, from the church over what happened at the Fourth Council in 451. 100 years later, you have this now emergence of parallel Chalcedonian and non-Chalcedonian jurisdictions. And his attempt, the Fifth Council was his attempt to, to re, bring a reunification. It didn't work, though. The, Mono, the Monophysite churches do not, um, aren't swayed by his attempts. Um, St. Just Saint Justinian, he is a saint in the church, dies in 565. His dynasty endures into 602. 
his line, endures till 602. It's replaced by the Heraclean dynasty of emperor, starting with Emperor Heraclius. And it's in the reign of the Emperor Heraclius that the Persians go to war again with Rome. They take Jerusalem. They, they sack the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. They take the True Cross back to Persia. And then it's Heraclius that then goes to war against the Persians. He restores the cross to Jerusalem in 529 or 629. But because of the battle, the war between the Romans and the Persians under Heraclius, this exhausts, in a sense, both in many ways, both empires. But it does, it ends a 400-year-old conflict between the Romans and the Persians. This is the Heraclius' battle with them, ending in 629, ends a 400-year on-and-off conflict between the Romans and the Persians. Both would be overwhelmed by the rise of Islam. Muhammad is born around 570. He begins preaching in Mecca in 613. He migrates or has to flee to Medina in 622. He goes back to Mecca and conquers it in 630, dying in 632. And his followers conquer Jerusalem in 636 to 637. And the San uh, Sasanian dynasty of Persia falls to Arab conquest in 651 and never recovers. Um, and so I point out all of this for a reason. There is no golden age that the church looks to restore. There is no utopia the church is working towards in this life. The kingdom of heaven is what we look forward to in the end of time. And we also understand that the kingdom of heaven can come, in a sense, and touch the kingdoms of this world and sanctify them. But that work is done in every generation. And so the empire embraced Christianity, but then at times abused the church for its own purposes, tried to manipulate the church at other times, or was hostile to it. And we saw that with emperors embracing Arianism and so forth. We weren't able to cover all the things going on in this period after Chalcedon, where the emperors were trying to forcibly reunite those who were divided through political power and edict. But that's that those kind of things went on throughout this history. But what you see continually is examples of like St. Patrick, St. Simeon, St. Bridget, St. Benedict, right? The monastics, what do they do? They, again, they go out from society, they establish in the monastery a piece of the kingdom of heaven, a place of refuge from the world, but for the world, so that those in the world have somewhere to go to, to find refreshment, in a sense, to touch the kingdom of heaven. And they themselves, in a sense, make that movement back and forth from the kingdom of heaven to the kingdom of this world, back and forth but for the purpose of sanctifying the world. The kings would come, the emperors would come to St. Simeon as he stood on his, on, on his pillar to ask advice. He didn't have to move. He moved the kings to him by his holiness. They sought him out to understand God's will. And so this is a continual movement in the life of the world, in the history of the world, where the church is trying to baptize as much of it as it can in each generation and sanctify as much of it as it can in each generation. And then the next generation comes along and either embraces that or rejects it. And the process continues continually over and over and over. Sometimes the empire or the kingdoms of the world embrace the faith. Sometimes they try to manipulate it. 
Sometimes they try to use it to their advantage, and sometimes they persecute it. But it's a continual process of each generation going on. And that's what you see with St. John Chrysostom. The emperor embraces him and then throws him out. So there's nothing new. This is what it will be like continually. So there is no golden age, but the gospel is always at work and able, in a sense, to sanctify the world. So next week, we're going to talk about, we'll go back to Rome and we'll talk about the Byzantine popes, specifically Gregor the Great. We'll start with him um, and how what Leo attempted to do at the Fourth Council was not carried through with in the time of Gregory the Great and subsequent popes um, and, and kind of what, 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 what's going on in the late 500s into the 600s and 700s uh, uh, in the church in Rome. So that's what's next week. Questions? So if Muhammad had stayed alive, do you think his goal was to conquer Jerusalem? Do you think do you think his followers fulfilled what he wanted? Or do you think they went rogue because Muhammad had died? Um, the question is, is did Muhammad intend to conquer Jerusalem? Um, and were his disciples fulfilling what Muhammad would have wanted? Um, and you have to remember Islam is is spread by conquest even in Muhammad's day. Well, Muhammad leads his army. Okay. So um, the, is, Islam spreads very rapidly because it spreads through um, armed conflict. So yeah, no, I don't think it's a, there's, there's not a question whether Muhammad wanted Jerusalem or not. Mm -hmm. He did. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the second holiest site in, in all of Islam is in Jerusalem, the Dome of the Rock. So it's it's yeah, um, and that's just that that those are aspects of, of of the teaching of Muhammad. So yeah. Question? Any other questions? Let's see. Teresa says, uh, "Not a question, but I find it very interesting that the question of papal primacy." happened long before the official schism between the East and the West. Yes, the idea of papal primacy, Leo, in a sense, asserts it the first time, and then it's picked up later on by other popes and reasserted and kind of morphs and changes and evolves, um, and especially in the 11th century. That's when it really takes off. So, all right. God bless you all. Thank you, Father. Thank you.